الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد وعسى أن تقره شيئا وهو خير لكم Our dear friends, we carry on with our discussion of the aphorisms of Ibn Ata'illah al-Iskandari rahimahullah. So we move on to aphorism number 83, which is on page 194. Page 194 of the Book of Wisdoms. So this is what Ibn Ata'illah says. It's a very short wisdom, but it's amazing in its profundity. It's a very incredible statement. رُبَّمَا أَعْطَاكَ فَمَنَعَكَ وَرُبَّمَا مَنَعَكَ فَأَعْطَاكَ So رُبَّمَا أَعْطَاكَ فَمَنَعَكَ وَرُبَّمَا مَنَعَكَ فَأَعْطَاكَ What that means is, he's saying that sometimes he gives you while depriving you. And sometimes he deprives you in giving. So sometimes he gives you but deprives you. And other times he deprives you but gives you. So in his deprivation is a giving. And when he deprives you, he's actually giving you something. And when he gives you, some, in some cases, if he gives you something that you really want, he's depriving you from something better. So that's what it is. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's nidham, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's system, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's way of doing things. He's the master, he's the creator. He is above all in charge of everything. He knows what he wants to do. He knows what he wants, where he wants it, and at what time he wants it. And we're just part of that system. So he has this huge system where he's dealing with everybody at once. We are just one clog, very, very, very small clog in that system. But somehow we try to think that we're much bigger than we are when we try to control things in a certain way. Of course, we have a bit of control. He's given us free will. So we've, we can definitely control things, and things are predictable. So if I raise my hand, it will rise up. If I reach out to get something, I will normally be able to pick it up. So the world is definitely a predictable place, but it's not a guaranteed place that everything you will try to achieve, you will get. So while at the same time, it's not that you will get everything that you set out to achieve, but at the same time, it is not so up there in the air or so fickle or so unpredictable that even if you go and make an effort that you never get it. So you have a, if you have a glass and you have some water and you want to pour into the glass, if you do it correctly, most people are going to get that right. It is never going to be that I'm trying to do it right, but the water is somehow right above, it's above, but somehow it's actually going there or going here and it's not falling into the cup somehow. That's kind of absurd. I mean, I mean, I know this is obvious stuff. But in the grand realm of things, we know we can understand putting water into a cup or meat opening this and drinking from here. It's quite obvious. But we need to think of even the big matters in the same way. That if we do things in the right way, it will happen. If I want to marry somebody and I do the right things, it's possible that it will happen. But it may not happen as well. In this case, obviously, there's somebody else involved here as well. They have a whole life. They've got people associated with them. They've got decisions, they've got factors that they have to consider. It's not just me that I want to marry that woman, so I must get her. There's too many factors involved here. You have to remember, there's her, there's all her family members, there's her circumstances, there's her internal feelings. All of that has to also be right for that to come together. And then to stay together. That's very difficult. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best of planners of all of these things because he knows all of these things and he is the one who is in charge of all of the factors at the end of the day. We have only a certain amount, so we're just a small aspect of this world. We try our best within the dimension, within the realm of our control, our perceived control at least, and then we have to leave it. Now, what this is giving us is a philosophy. What this is giving us is a philosophy. If, if people can... This is, these are words that could be really, really inspirational. People can just, just take them to heed that saying, sometimes you'll receive something that you really want. But what that has done is that it actually deprived you of something bigger. 
you may only find out later about that. And then you think, oh no, why did I do it this way? Why did I choose this option? I should have chosen that option. Look how beautiful that is now. Look where that's gone. Look at that investment. I think a good example would be that I chose to invest here and not here. And then there was a problem here. Oh yeah, simpler still, something on a day-to-day -day basis. I should have taken that road, but I took this one instead. I thought this was going to get there faster, but they got there much faster, and I got stuck in half an hour traffic. That's our control, subhanAllah. That's the limit of our control. That's, that's what it is. So that's why he's saying that sometimes he gives you what you want, but he's depriving you from something that's more important. And sometimes he'll deprive you. That, that's the tough part. You see the one about he gives you, you feel good at that time. I've got what I wanted. Right? And then you may regret later. Um, or you may not, never, never even know. But you could have been much better off, but you never know. So maybe you're not even upset. But in most cases, I guess for this work, you will find out. But in other cases, it's where we want something and we don't get it. That's more upsetting. Because, hey, I didn't get this. And you have to wait that out and then you get the happiness later. Whereas in the first case, you're quite elated first. You're quite excited first that you've gotten what you want. And then after that, you're like, oh no, why did I get that? I've been deprived now of something better. So I don't know which is worse. I think the second one is worse generally for people because they think that they're losers because of that. So it's a really interesting idea, but it really sums up our world. And if, if we understand that that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala behind everything, make things easy for us to understand, that what this hinges on is ultimately Allah ta'ala's wisdom and his foresight and his absolute knowledge of everything. So if we can just say, look, I'm going to do my best, I'm going to worship Allah, I'm going to show my devotion to Him, I'm going to remember Him and I'm going to thank Him, and I'm going to have patience when there's difficulties, then I'm going to make an effort though in trying to get what's beneficial for me because that's what the Prophet ﷺ told me to do, and that's what I'm required to do, that's what I've been built to do by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if I don't get sometimes, then I'm going to realize that there's probably something better in this uh, absence, in this prevention from me, in this hindrance from me. I'm going to get something better. And sometimes I must be careful that if I do get something, well, maybe I've lost out on something better. So let me not get too excited about this. Let me not get too excited about this. Nothing wrong with getting excited and happy about something that you receive. It's not like every time we receive something that there's going to be something better off that we should be worried about that, hey, why didn't we get this and why did we get it? We shouldn't become, our life should not become like this. But the idea is that don't get so excited because we may discover that actually there may have been a better option in that case. Okay, so let us uh, see what our Ibn Ajib rahimahullah tells us about this. He says, you see, if we go down to our nafs and our behavior, our psychology, the nafs, al-ammara, and the lawama, until we get to mutma'inna, which we've discussed in previous uh, lessons in the tasawwuf series there's a whole a sufism series there's a whole discussion about this but when a person has the evil inciting self the lower ego and also the lawama which means the 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 blaming soul it feels good when we're given something everybody feels good when they're given something you receive your new phone you mashallah you know you have a good sleep you feel good so anything that we're given, any good experience that we have, our nafs expands and feels good and has a sense of enjoyment. And the other problem is that when, we're, when we don't receive something, when we're prohibited from something, when we're prevented from something, when we miss out on something, it contracts. You feel bad. That's the dopamine rush. You don't get a dopamine rush. There's other chemicals that are probably released. That's why it makes you feel a bit down. And then after that, if there's something that good comes about, you get a good achieve, you achieve something well, then again it opens up as well. Again. The problem with that is people get really addicted to this and that can be sometimes very, very wrong. A human being is supposed to be satisfied with Allah. As long, long as they're doing the right thing, they should be satisfied with whatever state Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts them into. And what, the, what social media has done today is that it's given you a very easy way. Because all you, for some people, especially when they're beginning, they're just like a, they just need a few likes. Just a few ticks, a few likes. 
That's really wonderful. That's a lot of validation. So it's excitement. It's that excitement. Now, when you get the same number of likes, you start th thinking that that's become the standard. So then you have to do something to get more likes, higher likes, more following. Because the purpose is not to necessarily educate someone else or to just tell a story to someone or whatever. It's actually to get feedback, positive feedback, so that we can feel good. It's a very nafsi en enterprise. I mean, I've, I'm using social media, so I completely understand this. It's a very nafsi enterprise. You have to be very careful because you, you get caught up because that's what it's all about. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to, there are tutorials out there that tell you how to get better on social media, how to become more popular. That's what it's about. It's not like somebody's doing this in some kind of, you know, hidden way that these are just hidden ways. No, this is open. This is what it is. This is what you do on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and so on and so forth. Not to say it's wrong to do that if you've got the right purpose for doing it. But it's very easy to get caught up in that. How do you sift if you're into the da'wah? If you're into, okay, if you're into business, understandable, right? It's halal to do business on social media, promote your business. So how do you know? It's just, it's, it's just that when you think you're being rewarded for your good work that you're doing on there, and then it's actually really for the nafs and it's not really for the good work. Or the good work is a secondary issue. That's when it gets a bit more complicated. So, الغالب على النفس الأمارة واللوامة أن تنبسط بالأعطاء وتنقبض بالمنع. When we receive something, we we have a dopamine rush and it, the soul expands. Oh yeah, lovely. And it contracts when we're prevented from something. Reason is obvious that when you receive something, when you're given something, that is what the desire of the nafs is. So you're fulfilling a desire, your enjoyment, its indulgence. So it's going to have to expand by that. That's obvious, right? It's going to expand by that. And if you're prevented from something, you're not giving it its food. When people don't have food, they have issues. When they've not had a meal, they get aggravated. They've not had their sleep. They have a problem. They've done a survey of, they've done, a research, they've done research on sleep deprived people. It's so bad, you know, to be sleep deprived, although that's another subject is that they deprive somebody, they deprive people from sleep for like a week or something, and then they tested them with certain decisions and everything. They found that they act very similar to people with mental health problems. That's how important sleep is. It's going to contract with that when, you, when you're deprived of something. It's going to happen. And all of this though, all of this is because of li jahliha bi rabbiha is because of its ignorance and unawareness of their Lord, of their sustainer, of the one who is in charge of all of these things for them. That's why. They've just misunderstood this. They've just not understood it. If they'd had understood about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you would know sometimes that when He prevents something from you, He's actually giving you something. When He prevents something from you, when something doesn't come to you, you're going to get something else. There's another benefit that's going to ensue from there. And sometimes if he's giving you something, you don't realize this is when you're going to forget because you're so excited. right? If he doesn't give you something, sorry, if he gives you something, then he's actually preventing you from someone else, from something else. So the best thing for a Muslim to do is to understand their Lord and have that refined understanding of their true, uh, true tawheed of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And... More so, if somebody is connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at some level, uh, but in a negative sense, in, when they don't get something, they start blaming Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that is probably even worse, to blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you're supposed to have some awareness, but you've got a complete wrong idea about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's somebody who won't even bring Allah into the picture, they'll just be upset. There's others will be upset and then blame Allah that why didn't you give me this? Why, why are you just choosing me to deprive? Why is it always me? I don't know which one's worse. One is unawareness. The other one is that he thinks he's aware of Allah. He thinks he's... I don't know. I don't know which one is worse. Allah prevent us from both. So anyway, what happens is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes He gives you 
that which your nafs, that which nafs desires, that which the ego and people desire. But what he does is that he then prevents you. So you've got something that's going to so excite you and engross you and distract you. But so what he's done in that is actually by that he's prevented you from presence with the Holy One. You've missed the next prayer because of that. You've missed going to the masjid because of that. Now you might think, what's a big deal? I've just missed going to the masjid because I was trying out my new car, or trying out my new game, or trying out my new computer. Or I was eating at that very good restaurant. Right? Or I was with, with friends. What's the big deal? Well, okay, maybe. You've just missed 25 times more reward. Right? You've also missed being in the house of Allah, which you could have been in. Right? And all of that rahmah and mercy. Right? You've just missed that part of the masjid bearing witness for you on the day of judgment. Just so many, this can open up in so many ways. Right? I'm just talking about that particular scenario. Sometimes he will prevent you from what your nafs desires, but by that you will have much more presence with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you'll gain more comfort with him. Because you'll turn to Allah in that. You've been getting everything you've been after so far and you've been forgetting Allah. So now he's prohibited it from you so you've started coming off your high horse and started thinking about, hey, what is it? Ya Allah, what, is, what have I done wrong? Oh Allah. And then you start worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you gain comfort with Allah. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you from the enjoyments and the adornments of this world, but then He will prevent you from the adornment of His presence and the shine of that presence and the light that comes from that presence. Sometimes He will give you the adornment, or sometimes he'll prevent you from the adornment of the world, but then he'll actually give you being present uh, with him, in with him, and gaining his vision. Sometimes Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will give you the sustenance and the provisions of what bodies, what humans receive. So you'll get abundant money, abundant food, abundant supplies. But he is preventing from you the supplies and the provisions of the heart. So mashallah, you've got lots of food and ability to eat where you want and wear whatever you want, but he's just prevented you from giving anything to your soul. And sometimes he will actually give for your soul, but you may not have the outer, the indulgence, the, even the food for the outer self. Amazing system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are such people, they're very poor. But they're very satisfied. Somehow their heart is being fed, which is even more important. And yet there's others who have a lot to eat, a lot to wear, a lot to choose from, but they have emptiness. They have inner emptiness. As a Muslim, any Muslim, any Muslim, just the fact, any Muslim with a, the basic understanding of their aqidah has a lot more, has a lot more than somebody who doesn't believe in God. Right? Maybe not all the time you'll see that, but you'll see that time at the time of difficulty. Just the mere small amount of belief. And that's why Muslims, you see, there's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of people out there. And there's other people who can tell them what to, how to make money. There's lots of that. There's a lot of them, how could, uh, there's a lot of people out there who can tell them how to gain comfort. We Muslims don't need to be telling them that. What we need to be telling them is to share what we have. We have an antidote to emptiness. Belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't Allah helped you in your moment of vulnerability. And this people, this is the biggest thing that people are suffering from an emptiness. And a lot of this modern tradition of flux, of just do what's good, just do what you think is good for you, with no limit, with no destination, with no goal, it's just going to change every year. That just shows you the emptiness that they're looking for something. Which changes every year. The trends change every year. This was taboo 20 years ago and now it's completely fine. And then there's going to be more and more and more and more of that. Because there's emptiness. So you're looking for something to fill into. With Muslims, or fill in to that. With Muslims you've got an idea. You just have to learn that more. And there's a limit. There's an objective. There's a goal. And we know our purpose. If anybody who knows the purpose of where you came from, 
where you're going and why you are here, then that is so much better than a lot of other people who don't have that. So as Muslims, that's the biggest da'wah that we can give is to just fill hope. For example, if there's somebody, you know, you've got somebody who never gets too agitated. Imagine you work in a, in a normal environment in an office somewhere. And there's a guy in that office, he never gets too agitated, he's always quite calm, he deals with challenges quite decently, and he uh, d doesn't get involved in the gossip, he tries to avoid the gossip and the backbiting and all that, doesn't use curse words, he's not very insulting, is a pleasant person to be around. Yes, sometimes he's seen doing a few weird things like in a corner in the room or something like that, you know, bowing down and things like that. People are going to wonder why you're so calm. No, that's a Muslim. He's a Muslim. He's a Muslim. That's what. What is it in that faith that he feels so wholesome? And he doesn't seem so empty that he has to resort to all of these other things that people do. That's the biggest da'wah. Which other da'wah do you want to do? Openly, there's a lot of da'wah. If you know how to do it, speak the speak. You know, speak the words. But this is the da'wah that is going to help the people fill their emptiness in action. This is what this is teaching us of how to understand Allah and to react to different situations. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant you the attention of creation. It will be very popular. Right? But then He will prevent you from the attention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will prevent you from having the attention of people, but He has given you comfort and the attention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may give you various different forms of knowledge and will open up to you the, the doors of understanding. So you'll get things, you're very smart. But the problem is that he will then prevent you from knowing the reality of things as they should be known in terms of their benefit of the hereafter. And for you to really know al hayyul qayyum the truly living and the self-subsisting one. You won't know that. You'll understand everything else. You'll be the biggest scientist, biggest thinker in the world, but you just don't know what's important for you. And how many of those kind of people have we had? They've been deluded just about this one point. They be reinterpreting in ways that they know it doesn't even understand. I mean, what does, what does dancing to your G DNA mean? How does somebody dance to their DNA? What kind of an explanation is that? It's like absurd. But because it's coming from a person who's considered to be, you know, quite smart and intelligent, there must be some understanding on it. We just don't get it. There must be something about it. So people actually will start using that terminology, that statement, without really understanding it. This is the weirdest part. Taqlid. Taqlid works everywhere. You know, blind following. Just because you've seen an authority and you've gained some respect for the authority. So you'll take what they say without really understanding it. It's very interesting how humans work. I've seen this. When we have students who are writing fatwas, if there's another mufti that they trust, you know, another scholar, and one scholar has said that, you just take it. So, so when I question them, I said, what do you mean by this? What's the evidence behind it? They don't know, but he said it. So that's not, we need to know evidences back to you know, our main sources. People do taqlid in everything. So they do it in this as well. They don't know what they're following. They just say the same thing. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will prevent you from knowing so many various different sciences. But He will give you such comfort and such tranquility with Him, the living and the self-subsistent one. And afterwards, you will actually become completely encompassing of everything that is out there that is that, that, that others will not know. You will get a basira and a divine insight into that. Subhanallah, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the honor of the dunya, but He will deprive you of the honor of the hereafter. But sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will prevent you from having honor in this world, but He'll give you the honor of the akhirah. And there's been so many people like that. They were disgraced in this world. They were on the haqq, they were on the truth, but the batil was very prevalent at the time. And they had to go, they were persecuted. But they get the benefit of the hereafter. 
Now you never know these things, you see. You never know these things. That's the only way to gain comfort with this is to know your deen and know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and continue to worship Him that way. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the ability to be to be honored by having a lot of people around you. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not be in your life, so you'll be prevented from that. And sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will prevent you from having so many people around you, but then He'll give you the ability to be with the King of all kings. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow you and give you the service of all people. So they will serve you, they will do your bidding. But the problem is that He will prevent you from witnessing the one who allows all of these things to happen, the one who creates all of these things. And sometimes Allah will prevent you from receiving the services of others, but He will allow you to witness the one who gives everything and who produces and creates everything. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not allow you, will hinder you from being able to do whatever you want but he'll give you something else of the higher realms to benefit from. But at other times, so it just, sometimes Allah will prevent you from whatever you want to do, whatever you do, you, you're just going to get frustrated, but then he'll give you something higher, as long as you recognize him. And so on and so forth. This is basically life, just think about it. Don't get too perturbed by what you lose. Because maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has something better for you. And you know, once you lose it, you see, you might think that this is a kind of a cop-out. It is not. It really helps a person. This is how Allah has created. This is the reality. That when you don't get something, when you've tried to get it, you've done everything that you have tried to get it, and you didn't get it, so alhamdulillah. What else are you going to do afterwards? Why don't you assume that he's prevented you? Maybe he's going to give you something better. Because that's a reality. It happens. That's why Ibn al-Arabi... Al-Hatimi, Ibn Arabi Al-Hatimi says, إِذَا مُنِعْتَ فَذَاكَ عَطَاءُ وَإِذَا أُعْطِيتَ فَذَاكَ مَنْعُ فَاخْتَرِدْ تَرْكَ عَلَى الْأَخْذِ Just summing up this thing, he says that if you have been uh, prevented, then that's his giving. And if you were given, then that could be his prevention. That could be him preventing. So choose the abandonment over the acquisition sometimes. That's better for you. And I think this is all summed up with the verse that I read right in the beginning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? In Surah Al-Baqarah, عَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ وَعَسَىٰ أَن تُحِبُّ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ شَرٌ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Right? That perhaps you dislike something, whereas it's actually better for you. And sometimes you love something, you prefer something, but it's actually bad for you. You don't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything, but you don't know. If, if you say you're believers in Allah, right, and you don't get this, then what kind of a belief do you have in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If this is, if it's not, if your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to help you here, what is the point of that belief? The belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be so active, should be so active, that it should benefit you in everything. It should be part of everything because that's how the belief in Allah is. Allah, the belief in Allah should be totalizing, affecting everything that we know. If it's only going to come when we pray or if it's only supposed to come when we sit and remember Him, then what about the rest of life? Isn't that a place? That's more a place, in fact, where we need Allah because that's when we need to make decisions. So Allah should be there at the forefront in everything that we do whether that's something that you've just received as enjoyment. If you do a business and you receive good business, you need to be thanking Allah for that. And you'll only get more. If you've received a, a shortcoming, then you need to realize exactly the, the nasiha of today. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that. Let us read what Shaykh Abdullah Gangohi rahimahullah says about this as well. He says it. So this is based on this aphorism. Sometimes he gives while depriving you and sometimes he deprives you in giving. The of, it often happens that on account of the worldly adornments, luxuries and pleasures that Allah Most High grants one, one becomes immoderately involved in these mundane activities. 
To the extent that one is deprived of the success and sweetness of obedience, halawat al-iman, halawat al-iman. To the extent that one is deprived of the success and sweetness of obedience, when the ego is engaged in the pleasures of the world, it cannot experience the pleasures of obedience. When we're so focused on small screens, right, even large screens, when they're so focused on them, we don't focus on the screen of this world. So we can't see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we're so concentrated on artificial things. That actually, Allah is saying, look around. But we're so focused on something smaller. Ramadan is coming. And that's the time to open up the heart. To open up the spiritual heart. That's why Allah sends it, sends it to us. So, he then says, it also often happens that one's deprivation of worldly pleasures is regarded as a misfortune. However, one is given the success and sweetness of worship in lieu of it. The servant should not therefore focus his gaze on the superficial worldly bestowals and deprivations. He should understand the reality, the haqiqah of everything and discharge the right of every occasion. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a true understanding and implementation uh, of this so that we can actually uh, remain content with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa akhir da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. اللهم انت السلام انت السلام تبارك في هذا الجلال والاكرام اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم يا الله فقف اس يا الله فقف اس يا الله فقف اس يا الله purify us يا الله grant us forgiveness for our shortcomings our wrongs our defects our excesses oh Allah those we remember especially those that we've forgotten oh Allah make the rest of our life better than the previous part of our life make every subsequent day better and superior and make the best of our days our final days oh Allah allow us to stand in front of you and we love to meet you and you want to meet us oh Allah grant us your love and the love of those whose love benefits us in your courts oh Allah grant us love of your obedience and oh Allah grant us hatred for your disobedience oh Allah make your love beloved to us oh Allah we ask that you Shower your, us with your generosity, your benevolence, your clemency, your forbearance. O oh Allah, shower us with your mercy. O oh Allah, shower us with your rahmah. O oh Allah, grant us your light and allow us to see by your light, both in this world, but especially in the hereafter. O oh Allah, bless all of those who are here and O oh Allah, who are listening to this. O oh Allah, bless those who facilitated this and O oh Allah, accept us. And O oh Allah, allow all of our permissible needs and projects to be fulfilled and completed. Accept us all for the service of your deen and prevent us from all of those things which are worthless and useless and are of t considered time waste. And O oh Allah, grant us blessings in our work and in our jobs and in our businesses and in our investments and our assets, especially regarding the hereafter. O oh Allah, accept and allow us to follow in the footsteps of our Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and grant us his company in the hereafter. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon wa salamun al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi wa